the mid latitudes of the northern hemisphere from October to December our viewpoint for the night sky it's mid evening and we're looking north nights are colder and longer and the daytime Sun is lower in the sky the same goes for the plow or Big Dipper its seventh star hidden beneath the horizon the pattern is part of Ursa Major the Great Bear from farther north of course the whole constellation is visible in Ursa Major, two stars point to the fifth brightest star in the heavens, Vega. Vega dominates Lyra, the constellation of the harp or lyre. Despite its proximity to the horizon, Ursa Major is an invaluable signpost. The stars Merak and Dubé direct an arc to the pole star, Polaris. Polaris is in Ursa Minor, the constellation of the little bear. Curving onward, the arc reaches Cassiopeia, the mythical queen banished to the heavens for her vanity. But, lying in the Milky Way, the constellation is truly beautiful. Star fields abound, glorious through binoculars and small telescopes. One such is NGC 663, an open cluster near the star Rukbar. Slightly closer to Rukbar, M103, an irregular open cluster. And to the other side of Rukbar, NGC 457, a looser open cluster. From two stars in Cassiopeia, a line to Alderamin, brighter star in the constellation of Cepheus, husband of Cassiopeia and king of Ethiopia. lower in the sky to a pattern coiled around the north celestial pole. This is Draco the dragon, with Eltonin at the dragon's head, its brightest star. Northwest and spanning the Milky Way, the majestic constellation of Cygnus the swan. The mighty star Deneb is the tail. Overhead and right from Cygnus, the zigzag of Lacerta the lizard. Although its stars are inconspicuous, Lacerta lies partly in the Milky Way and boasts at least one splendor. NGC 7243 is a scattered open cluster of several dozen stars and visible in small telescopes. Also in Lacerta, but clear of the Milky Way, an object seen only in the biggest amateur telescope. BL Lacerta isn't a star, but the bright nucleus of a remote quasar-like galaxy. Such phenomena, called BL lax, can double their brilliance in a day. With the Milky Way strung above, we return to Ursa Major for a signpost. The stars Migres and Dubé point to the sixth brightest star in the heavens, Capella. Capella is in Auriga, the charioteer, straddling the Milky Way Auriga is large and prominent. Again from Ursa Major, Fad and Dubé return us to the Milky Way and Murfak, a supergiant. Through binoculars, Murfak sits in a brilliant scattering of stars, the abundant constellation of Perseus, the hero. In Greek mythology, Perseus slayed the Gorgon, Medusa, and rescued Andromeda, daughter of Cepheus and Cassiopeia. The handle of his sword marks two of the finest open clusters in the sky. Magnificent in binoculars, NGC 884 and 869 are just visible by naked eye. Higher in Perseus, to Medusa's evil eye, Algol, the star that winks. It does so because Algol is a binary, two stars whose combined brilliance appears to vary as they eclipse each other. Close to Algol, the Perseus cluster of galaxies. Visible only in large telescopes, they include a so-called Seyfert galaxy, possibly with a black hole, and jetting out material at near the speed of light. The Seyfert NGC 1275 has a brilliant quasar-like nucleus, but it's less energetic. 
Near the far western star of Perseus is M76, the little dumbbell nebula, a shell of gas puffed off by an old sun-like star. It's just visible in a moderate telescope. The naked eye star, Minkib, or Xi Persei, illuminates NGC 1499, the California Nebula, again, just visible in a moderate telescope. Northeast of Perseus, to the far right, and partly in the Milky Way, are the stars Castor and Pollux. They're the heads of the twins in the constellation of Gemini. Lower in the sky, the obscure pattern of Lynx, but with a small telescope, Lynx has some good double stars. To the southwest, the equally dim constellation of Camelopardalis, the giraffe. Within it, and at the very edge of naked eye visibility, the open cluster NGC 1502. Binoculars reveal some 45 stars. A final view of the northern sky. The panorama south has Orion, the constellation of the hunter, far left. Next door is Taurus, the bull, another bold and distinctive pattern. To the west, Greek mythology suggests a group of stars born from the blood of Medusa. It's Pegasus, the winged horse, with the familiar square. Upper left in the square, the star that was once Delta Pegasi now belongs to neighboring Andromeda, but we're headed just right of the square. This is 51 Pegasi, the first star like our sun to be discovered with a planet. At half the mass of Jupiter, but far hotter, the planet whirls around the star in little over four days. 51 Pegasi is just visible by naked eye. So is this globular cluster M15, its collapsed core jammed with stars. The density is a puzzle caused perhaps by intense mutual gravity or a black hole. Higher in Pegasus to NGC 7331, a spiral edge-on galaxy, visible on good nights through a moderate telescope. Close by, the same applies to NGC 7339 and 7332, two galaxies, although not obviously interacting, probably orbiting one another. Half a degree south, five galaxies known as Stefan's Quintet, best observed in the most powerful amateur telescope. South of Pegasus, and only seen in big telescopes, the Einstein Cross. Multiple images of the same quasar surround a central galaxy. Without the galaxy, light from the distant quasar would travel directly to Earth. But with the galaxy, its gravity creates a crazy lens light from the quasar is bent. Through the Hubble Space Telescope, this gravitational lensing gives us four images of the quasar, with the lensing galaxy in the middle. Finally in Pegasus, and only in large telescopes, the Seyfert Galaxy, NGC 7742. Light from its brilliant core takes 72 million years to reach us. From their shared star, here called Alpha Rats, the constellation of Andromeda unfurls from Pegasus. Andromeda, the princess rescued by Perseus, is home to the Andromeda galaxy, M31. Like a big sister of the Milky Way, Andromeda is a spiral with two companion galaxies. By naked eye, on a clear night, it's the most distant object we can see. Upper right in Andromeda, the planetary nebula NGC 7662, one of the brightest and most easily seen by small telescope. Lastly in Andromeda, to the galaxy NGC 891. Although difficult, even in a moderate telescope, this edge-on spiral is one of the best of its kind. Immediately beneath Andromeda and Pegasus are the faint stars of Pisces. Pisces is the constellation of the fishes, 
supposedly tied from their tails to the star Alpha Piscium. The pattern has two special features. The first is this circlet of stars. The second is that the Sun, the Moon and the planets all pass through Pisces as a member of the zodiac. Close to the upper fish lies the galaxy M74. Although the brightest in Pisces, it still needs a moderate telescope. East of Pisces is where the Sun used to move from south to north across the celestial equator. 2,000 years ago, the constellation of Aries marked the spring equinox. Today, this annual transition happens in Pisces. In mythology, Ares is the ram whose golden fleece was sought by Jason and the Argonauts. A wider view to locate a faint but distinctive pattern between Ares and Andromeda, the tiny constellation of Triangulum, the Triangle. Its three main stars were well known to the ancients, resembling the Greek letter Delta. To their right is M33, the pinwheel or Triangulum galaxy. This face-on spiral, good in binoculars, belongs to our local group, although it's smaller than the Milky Way and Andromeda. In the arms of M33, stellar nurseries abound, like this region, NGC 604, with more than 200 hot and massive young stars. Still looking south from the northern hemisphere, the constellation of Cetus is center stage. Cetus is a large but faint pattern depicting a whale or sea monster. Supposedly it threatened Andromeda before Perseus saved her. Our target is Myra, the wonderful star, a pulsating supergiant orbited by a white dwarf. Varying from naked eye to small telescope visibility, Myra was the first long period variable discovered. North of Myra, toward the head of Cetus, M77, with its bright active core, our closest safe at galaxy and good in moderate telescopes. West from Cetus to a zodiacal constellation, one of three linked with water. This is Aquarius, the water bearer, named by the Babylonians who visualized a figure pouring water from a pitcher an image still used today. To the left in Aquarius, and visible by small telescope, is the variable star R. Aquarii. As a Myra type, it's a supergiant with a white dwarf drawing off material. Periodic fireworks result. To the right in Aquarius is NGC 7009, the Saturn Planetary Nebula, like this in the Hubble Space Telescope, reminiscent of Saturn in small instruments. Higher in Aquarius, to what appears as a fuzzy blob in binoculars, M2, a rich and compact globular cluster lying well beyond our galactic center. Finally, low in Aquarius, NGC 7293, the famous Helix Planetary Nebula, best in a moderate telescope. The helix is shells of gas expelled in the death throes of a star a little bigger than our sun. At its heart, all that remains is a white dwarf. In the panorama south, the constellation of Eridanus the river meanders from Orion to the horizon. Upper right, two stars in the square of Pegasus point to the bright star, Fomalo. Fomalo, just 22 light years away, is in the constellation of Piscis Ostrinus, the southern fish. We go closer to identify two faint and half-forgotten patterns. The first is Sculptor, for a reason as obscure as its stars, a sculptor's studio. The second is Fornax, the furnace, equally barren. From the northern hemisphere, the constellation south.
The equatorial zone, from October to December, our viewpoint for the night sky. It's mid-evening, and we're looking north. Bright stars abound. There's Deneb in Cygnus the Swan, and sweeping east, the stars of Lacerta the Lizard. Cepheus the King is below, with his queen Cassiopeia in the Milky Way. Next, Camelopardalis, the giraffe. Then Auriga, the charioteer, sporting brilliant Capella. The stars Castor and Pollux are the twins in Gemini. At this season, the Milky Way swings low. Above the Milky Way, the northwestern sky is dominated by the stars of Pegasus, the winged horse, with its distinctive square. Sharing a star with Pegasus, Andromeda, daughter of Cepheus and Cassiopeia. Overhead, Pisces, the constellation of the fishes. To the right, Aries the ram. And just below, Triangulum, the tiny triangle. This is a wonderful time for observers. The sky is bedecked with brilliant stars. One of the most glittering constellations straddles the Milky Way. With the bright stars Murfak and Algol, it's Perseus, the hero. Southeast is Taurus, with Aldebaran marking the eye of the bull, while upper right, Orion, has the stars Rigel and Betelgeuse. From the tropics, the constellations to the north. The view south from the equatorial zone is virtually clear of the Milky Way. Far to the east, Sirius, brightest of all stars, marks Canis Major, the big dog. The bright star Canopus is to the west. Canis Major just nuzzles the Milky Way, as do the stars above. With Rigel and Betelgeuse the brightest, this is Orion, the hunter. Rigel is close to the source of the meandering constellation of Eridanus, the river, running all the way to Achenar, its brightest star. Most of Eridanus is rather faint. From the sixth largest constellation to five much smaller, the first is Columba, the pattern of the dove. To the right, the two stars of Calum, the chisel, and farther right, Horologium, the constellation of the clock. Beneath is Dorado, the goldfish. And next door, Reticulum, the reticle, an old instrument for measuring star positions. Leaving the large and small Magellanic clouds just above the horizon, we move toward the southwestern sector of the sky. At the top, the bright star Fomolo marks Piscis Ostrinus, the southern fish. Lower left, the triangle of Hydrus, the little water snake, and above, with Achenar between, Phoenix, the mythical bird. Below, two more birds, Tucana, the pattern of the toucan, and Grus, the crane. To the southwest, the pattern of Indus, named in honor of native North Americans. To complete this southern panorama, we identify four constellations in the upper southwestern sky. The first bears little relation to its name, Fornax, the barren pattern of the furnace. Upper left, Cetus, the whale or sea monster, is a more convincing depiction. But Sculptor, the sculptor's studio, is as abstruse as its stars. To the right, however, Aquarius, the water bearer, has been a recognizable figure since Babylonian times. our tour of the equatorial skies. The mid-latitudes of the southern hemisphere, where nights are warming and shortening. From October to December, our viewpoint for the night sky. It's mid-evening and we're looking north. The Milky Way is a misty band on the horizon. Immediately above, with its great square, is Pegasus, the winged horse. Alpharats is the star lost to neighboring Andromeda, the beautiful princess. 
Low in Andromeda and equally beautiful, M31, the Andromeda Galaxy. Visible by naked eye and the largest in our local group, Andromeda resembles the Milky Way. Above Pegasus and Andromeda lies Pisces, the fishes, a constellation of the zodiac. Here in the southern hemisphere, Pisces is the site of the autumn equinox, where the sun crosses the celestial equator from south to north. 2,000 years ago, it happened in Aries. But Earth's slight wobble has shifted the transition. Beneath Aries, Triangulum, the triangle. And lower still, Perseus, the hero who saved Andromeda. Above is Aldebaran, brightest star of Taurus the Bull, with the Pleiades, or Pleiades, to the left, the most famous open star cluster in the sky. Two stars in the square of Pegasus signpost Fomalo. Just 22 light years away, Fomalo is twice the size of the Sun and 13 times as luminous. As the beacon of Piscis Ostrinus, the southern fish, Fomalo is well named the fish's mouth. For in the disk that surrounds the star, a mouth could be opening where material clumps into planets. Down from Piscis Ostrinus is Aquarius, the water bearer, a constellation of the zodiac. Right from Piscis Ostrinus, the dim pattern of Sculptor, supposedly a sculptor's workshop. Although its stars are of little interest, Sculptor has two fine examples of edge-on galaxies, astronomically fairly rare phenomena. The first is NGC 55, Good in binoculars, a big telescope can resolve individual stars. Another galaxy, oblique rather than edge-on, is the cartwheel. It looks this way because an intruder careened through, creating a great ripple of stars. The culprit, possibly a small galaxy to the right. The cartwheel needs a large telescope. Unlike Sculptor's second edge-on spiral, NGC 253. At about 10 million light years, it's fine in binoculars. Still looking north from the southern hemisphere, we close on a faint set of stars that include Deneb Katos and Myra. This is Cetus, the constellation of the whale. Upward and right is Fornax, the furnace. Despite its name, nothing glows in Fornax but powerful telescopes reveal galaxies. This one, NGC 1316, is a cannibal devouring other galaxies. It's a member of the Fornax cluster, a compact group 60 to 65 million light years distant. Many are elliptical galaxies, but not this one, NGC 1365, a classic barred spiral some 200,000 light years across. Lastly, in the northern sky, a couple of important constellations. The first is the hunter, Orion, with its bright stellar markers, Rigel and Betelgeuse. The second is often overlooked because of its faintness and length, Eridanus, the river. At this season, it runs from way overhead to near Orion's star, Rigel. In a loop of the river is the galaxy NGC 1300, a barred spiral but visible only in larger telescopes. Nearby, the same goes for NGC 1232, twice as wide as the Milky Way. The Northern Sky. This is the panorama south from the mid-latitudes of the Southern Hemisphere. To the east, the sky is dominated by the stars Canopus and Sirius, as the brightest star of all, Sirius marks Canis Major, the big dog. Likewise, Carina, the ship's keel, is flagged by Canopus. In between is Puppis, poop deck of the legendary ship Argo Navis. Below are its sails, Vela. Supposedly, Jason sailed Argo Navis in search of the Golden Fleece. Before it was divided, Argo Navis was the biggest constellation. 
High in the heavens, two bright stars, Rigel and Achenar, mark either end of Eridanus, the celestial river. Part of it meanders overhead into the northern sky. Beneath is Columba, in mythology, the dove released by Jason and the Argonauts. To the right, Calum, the two stars of the chisel. And still farther right, Horologium, faint and obscure, the constellation of the clock. It honours the pioneering of the pendulum clock by the Dutch astronomer Christian Huygens. Horologium has at least two treasures, the globular cluster NGC 1261, whose stars can be resolved in a moderate telescope, and at the eastern end of the pattern, the galaxy NGC 1512, a magnificent barred spiral. Discernible in binoculars, this image is from Hubble. West from Horologium, high in the sky, is the stellar beacon of Fomalo. Between Fomalo and Achenar is Phoenix, the mythical bird, but more like a moored riverboat. In this sector of the southern sky, stargazing is like bird watching. With Phoenix at the top, the water bird Grus is nearby, the pattern of the crane. Below, toward the horizon, is Parvo the peacock. And completing the flock, Tucano, the constellation of the Toucan. Upper right, Fomalo marks Piscis ostrinus, the southern fish, while below, honouring native North Americans, is Indus. This is the region of the Magellanic Clouds, two misty patches that are satellite galaxies of our Milky Way. With the large Magellanic Cloud on the left, we head for its lesser companion. On a good night, the small cloud is visible by naked eye, but there's no missing the object on the right. Unconnected with the cloud, this is the globular cluster 47 Tucani, second largest and second brightest of its kind. At this season, the Magellanic clouds make excellent observing. They're either side of Hydrus, the triangle of the little water snake. Above the large cloud is reticulum, the reticle, a device for measuring star positions. A wider view shows the goldfish, Dorado, with its tail flicking the large cloud. Toward the head, NGC 1566, a Seyfert galaxy. The brilliant nucleus is like a quasar, but less energetic. Mensa, the table, is a bookend with Dorado as they unfold the large Magellanic cloud and its 10 billion stars. Through binoculars and small telescopes, the LMC reveals clusters and individual stars. Pink nebulae of hydrogen gas are regions of stellar birth. The biggest is the Tarantula Nebula. Lower right, some massive stars destined to go supernova. And here, the largest, hottest and most massive stars ever seen. In 1987, a supergiant exploded in the LMC. For weeks, it could be seen by naked eye. These are its shock waves, the first ever photographed. Years later, this is the remnant of that cosmic flash. The LMC, our companion galaxy, is quite a showcase. This graphic guide to the heavens is complete.
To the earliest observers, the cosmos was the realm of the gods. They controlled day and night, the passage of the sun and moon. So too the constellations and those wandering stars we know today as planets. Great monuments honored the gods, but such monoliths had a practical function. They were the first observatories, marking the rising and setting of the sun, the moon and the stars, a celestial calendar with which the ancients could measure the seasons and predict events. Thus was born astronomy. Today, this nightly progress of the stars is little changed from the view of those first observers. What has changed is our understanding. Myth has yielded to science. We know, for instance, that the band of light in this time-lapse isn't milk spilt by the gods, but an edge-on perspective of our galaxy. It's the Milky Way, home to the sun and all the stars we see in the night sky. One galaxy among the 50 billion thought to comprise the universe. Face on, the Milky Way is a spiral of some 200 billion stars, many like our sun. They revolve around the galactic center, at whose heart, most probably, is a massive black hole. Carrying Earth and the planets with it, the sun takes 225 million years to complete one orbit of the galactic center. Lying in a spiral arm, the sun is two-thirds of the way out from the center. Quite remote from the seething energy of the core, with its veil of gas and dust. Like the stars of our immediate neighborhood, the sun is yellow, average, and middle-aged. And as astronomers discover more and more planets around other stars, the sun is certainly not unique. This is our own backyard, the nine planets of the solar system. Gas giants like Saturn and Jupiter, and four inner planets, rocky little worlds that include blue Earth. The spin of our tiny planet, an axis tilted by 23 degrees, and Earth's annual orbit of the sun determine our view of the cosmos. That window changes night by night, season by season, latitude by latitude, all charted in this graphic guide to the heavens. Stars are grouped into patterns or constellations, often characterized in celestial mythology. With computer animations, familiar constellations, and pinpoint destinations, the night sky comes alive. Objects visible only in binoculars or telescopes, or best understood with graphics, are signposted by the nearest star or constellation line. As with all the planets of the solar system, Earth revolves around the Sun. Each orbit takes a year, shorter than Mars and the outer planets, longer than the two innermost. Imagine a line extending from Earth through the Sun to the background stars. During the year, as Earth orbits the Sun, so the stellar backdrop changes. We can't see the stars, of course, because the Sun's so bright. But if we could, this is the path the Sun would appear to take from May to September. Astronomers call the line the ecliptic. Looking in the opposite direction, in the evening, this would be our view, a view that shifts from night to night. Season by season, the change is obvious. But over 24 hours, the shift is almost imperceptible. Because the stars rise and set just four minutes earlier each day. 
in three months, a shift of six hours. Again, looking toward the sun, remember it's our annual orbit of the sun that causes its apparent journey along the ecliptic. The stars through which it passes are the constellations of the zodiac. The ancients saw them as heavenly figures. Taurus, the bull. Gemini, the twins. Cancer, the crab. And Leo, the lion. Later in the year, after Leo, Virgo, the virgin. Then Libra, the balance or scales. And Scorpius, the scorpion. Afucius, the serpent bearer, is ignored by astrologers adding an extra constellation to the 12 used in horoscopes. Next, Sagittarius, the archer, Capricornus, the sea goat, and Aquarius, the water bearer. In the fourth and final season, Pisces, the fishes, Aries, the ram, and Taurus, the bull, where we started this cycle. The 12 signs of the zodiac used by astrologers have little in common with the 13 zodiacal constellations of modern astronomy. Astronomy is science. Astrology is not. The eight innermost planets of the solar system orbit the sun in roughly the same plane. The exception is the ninth, distant Pluto, with its eccentric orbit. This common plane means the innermost planets we see always appear on or close to the ecliptic, and they move quite differently through the sky to the stars. The workings of the solar system explain why planets don't feature in the star maps of this graphic guide. With their slightly elliptical orbits, the planets circle the sun at different speeds. Jupiter, the outermost here, takes 12 years for an orbit. The innermost, Mercury, just 88 days. Venus and tiny Mercury are best observed shortly after sunset and just before dawn. Neither climbs far above the horizon, so tight are their orbits of the sun. Mercury is difficult to see, barely clearing the skyline. But Venus, the most brilliant planet, can be bright enough to shine in daylight. Venus and Mercury lie between the Sun and Earth with its circling moon. The planets farther out, like Mars, Jupiter and Saturn, display the weirdest movements in the heavens, so-called retrograde motion. Once a year in the zodiac, the planet Jupiter hiccups in its normal west to east motion, with a little backward loop. The same happens with Saturn, here through two consecutive years. With Jupiter the example, the cause is the faster solar orbit of Earth. As it overtakes Jupiter, the planet appears to go backward. Then, as Earth swings toward the other side of the Sun, Jupiter goes forward again. The moon, after the sun, the brightest object in the sky. Both a fascinating partner and the curse of astronomers denied the dark skies essential for the best observing. The moon, our mysterious neighbor. Mysterious because the ancients must have puzzled at its monthly phases. The moon has no light of its own. It merely reflects the sunlight, constantly illuminating half its face. In the 27.3 days of the lunar orbit, the amount of lit surface we see from Earth changes day by day, like this. The moon isn't in the star maps of this graphic guide, as with those wandering stars, the planets, the moon has a different dance to the stars of the cosmos.
It's because we have the moon that we enjoy the greatest astronomical spectacular, a total eclipse of the sun. There'd be more if it weren't for the five degree tilt of the moon's orbit with respect to the plane of the ecliptic, here in green. During each orbit of Earth, the moon twice intersects the ecliptic plane, here and here. For an eclipse to occur, Earth, Moon and Sun must all be in line at an intersection. Imagine you, the viewer, are the Sun. As alignment approaches, here's the total eclipse. If the intersection is on the far side of Earth, the event is a lunar eclipse. A lunar eclipse works like this. Moving into the shadow of Earth, the Moon turns blood red. Indirect light from the sun is bent and filtered by Earth's atmosphere and projected onto the moon. Lasting up to an hour and three quarters, a lunar eclipse is always seen on the night side of Earth. Now an eclipse of the sun, but because the moon's orbit is slightly elliptical, this eclipse isn't total. The moon's shadow doesn't quite reach us. The result is an annular eclipse. The moon, at its farthest from Earth, is too distant to fully obscure the sun. This time, the moon is closer in its orbit, close enough for the dark inner shadow, the umbra, to sweep Earth at supersonic speed. Such an alignment happens about 70 times a century. On Earth, the umbra is creating a total eclipse. The outer penumbra delivers a partial. For those in the shadow of the umbra, and with a clear sky, totality verges on the magical. As the moon creeps over the brilliant solar disk, this partial phase can last an hour and a half. The diamond ring. The moon is shutting off the sun. Then, as the last beams twinkle through the lunar mountains, Bailey's beads and totality. It happens because the sun is 400 times larger than the moon, while the moon is 400 times closer to us than is the sun. Beyond the sun, the moon and the planets are the stars of this graphic guide. Stars that each night appear to journey through the heavens. But it's not the stars that are moving, it's our planet, a daily rotation on an axis hitched to the celestial poles. The pole star, Polaris, marks the north celestial pole. Around it, star trails reveal the rotation of planet Earth in this overnight exposure. The south celestial pole has no marker star, just the nearby constellation of Crux Australis, the Southern Cross. As Earth rotates, so the sky appears to circle the emptiness of the South Celestial Pole. We see the varying brightness of stars and two blue patches, neighboring galaxies to our Milky Way. Here's how to find the North Celestial Pole. Identify the Plough or Big Dipper, an easy pattern. It's part of Ursa Major, the constellation of the Great Bear. Two stars point the way to the pole star Polaris. We've reached the North Celestial Pole. Our view is north from the mid latitudes of the Northern Hemisphere. It's mid-evening. With Ursa Major, these are the circumpolar constellations, stars that circle the pole. From this latitude, they don't rise and set like most constellations. But they have their seasonal shifts. Four minutes a night, six hours every three months. For the South Celestial Pole, string a line from Crux Australis, the Southern Cross, to Achenar, a brilliant star. The midpoint is the pole. A whole gaggle makes up the circumpolar constellations. Our view is south from the mid-latitudes of the Southern Hemisphere. It's mid-evening. 
These circumpolar stars don't rise or set, but they conduct their seasonal circuit. For the observer, whatever the season, only half the sky is visible from any point on Earth. In the Northern Hemisphere, this is the view from the mid-latitudes, the first zone featured in each of our four seasonal guides. Next is the equatorial zone, the tropics, the second featured in our guides. The third is the view from the mid-latitudes of the Southern Hemisphere, from places like Australia and southern South America. We're in the northern hemisphere, looking at the northern sky. Our target is the pole star, Polaris. Viewed first at 40 degrees north, say from Washington DC, Polaris drops lower in the sky, the farther south we travel. At Panama City, just 10 degrees north of the equator, Polaris would be here. South of the equator, Polaris is gone. Instead, in this view to the south, we see the south celestial pole. The farther south we go, the higher the pole rises. Now, at about 40 degrees south, this is the view from Melbourne, Australia. Although the tilt of Earth is always 23 degrees, its axis hasn't always pointed to the celestial poles of today. It's because Earth wobbles like a spinning top. Known as precession, the main cause is the Moon's pull on the equator. The effect on the North Celestial Pole is to move it around a great circle. Once the North Star was Thuban, Today it's Polaris, and in 4,000 years time, it'll be Alderamin. The whole cycle takes just under 26,000 years. As with maps of the world, astronomers divide the sky into a grid. Here, the celestial equator is drawn directly above Earth's equator. To the north, at 10 degree intervals, are lines of declination. It's the same to the south. They're like latitude lines. This line equals zero longitude. It's called the first point of Aries. To the left, divided into hours, minutes, and seconds, are lines of right ascension east, and the other side, lines of right ascension west. A reference grid that can pinpoint any celestial object. And there's a handy way to do it. The outstretched hand at arm's length measures off 15 degrees of sky, an hour's right ascension. The clenched fist is 10 degrees, again held at arm's length. The span of three fingers close together is 5 degrees. And finally, the little finger, set at arm's length against the heavens, is just 1 degree. But that's bigger than you think. In lunar terms, it's a lot of sky. By night, the moon may appear the largest celestial object, but it measures only half a little finger, half a degree. To get the best from stargazing, the observer needs a telescope, or at least good binoculars. Too much is missed by naked eye. For the new observer, Better to buy binoculars with quality optics than a poor telescope. The investment will last a lifetime. Marked on every pair are numbers specifying magnification and lens size. These, 10 by 50. The 10 indicates that this pair will give a tenfold magnification of the image. The 50 is the size of the lenses, both 50 millimeters. Here, the eyepieces are marked 5 millimeters. That's the width of the exit pupil, the light beam from the eyepieces. The size you need depends on age. If you're under 40, the pupils of your eyes will dilate to 7 millimeters. If you're over 40, just 5. If you're young, you'll see best through an exit pupil of 7 millimeters. So use binoculars marked 7 by 50 or 10 by 70. Dividing the numbers gives the exit pupil.
Compared with binoculars, telescopes are expensive. They must be solidly mounted on the likes of a rigid tripod. There are two sorts of telescope. This is a refractor. Light is collected by a lens and focused in the eyepiece. The minimum useful aperture is 75 millimeters. Telescopes with apertures greater than 100 millimeters are usually reflectors. Popular sizes are 150 and 220 millimeters. Light is collected by a primary mirror on the right, bounced to a secondary mirror and diverted to an eyepiece at the side. The detail and color we see in an astronomical object depend on how we gather its light. The bigger the lens or mirror, the more light is concentrated on the retina. But the naked eye is poor at seeing color at night. Unaided, this is how we see the Orion Nebula, lower frame. It's still black and white through binoculars or a small telescope. A moderate telescope gives more detail, but only through the biggest instrument does Orion's glory emerge, and that coaxed by supersensitive imaging. Many of the images in this graphic guide come from powerful professional telescopes, like this one in the Andes, or from here in Australia, where astronomer David Malin combines long exposure photography with special processing techniques. He reveals the true colors of stars. In this case, the true colors and detail of his Orion Nebula. Huge instruments, like the very large telescope in Chile, gather light as few stargazers can. Synchronized and combined with three others, this mirror equals a 16-meter eye. By comparison, orbiting 600 kilometers above, the Hubble Space Telescope has a modest mirror. But out here, it's untroubled by Earth's atmosphere. Hubble's brilliant pictures feature throughout this graphic guide. From our vantage point on Earth, and from above it, we've learned how to view the cosmos. But how do we measure its distance? Starting locally, our tiny planet is a mere speck against the Sun. The Sun has more than a hundred times the diameter of the Earth. This local star of ours could swallow us a million times over and still have room to spare. And here's another measure. Light from the sun takes under eight and a half minutes to reach Earth. And there's the clue. Using the speed of light, 300,000 kilometers a second, astronomers measure distance. To the nearest star system, Alpha Centauri, it's 4.3 light years. In other words, it takes more than four years for the light from Alpha Centauri to reach us. In terms of the Milky Way, from the Sun to our galactic center is 30,000 light years. Finally, a preview of some objects we'll meet in the seasonal sky guides that follow. The spiral arms of this galaxy abound in nebulae. We're interested in the pinkish ones, clouds of glowing hydrogen gas. Like the Lagoon Nebula in the Milky Way, such clouds are starbirth regions, known as gaseous emission nebulae. Another example is the Rosette Nebula. Emission means that the nebula emits its own light. The Rosette surrounds a group of stars called an open cluster. An open cluster may be a few dozen stars, or hundreds scattered across 50 light years. The most famous open cluster is the Pleiades, or Pleiades. These are reflection nebulae, clouds of gas and dust reflecting colored starlight. Two more, beautifully reflecting light from embedded stars. Now to dark nebulae, not holes in space, but dense clouds of dust. On the left, the Cone Nebula, a classic dark nebula in brilliant surroundings. And here, 
the most famous dark nebula, the Horsehead. Next, planetary nebulae. This is the Helix Nebula, formed as a dying star expels shells of gas. Another, more complex, is the Cat's Eye Nebula. And even more complex, the Hourglass Nebula. A planetary nebula is a form of emission nebula. So too is a supernova remnant. Here, the Crab Nebula. Supernova remnants are the entrails of giant stars that have exploded. As with all emission nebulae, supernova remnants generate their own light. Like tiny outriders around the great disk of our galaxy, float some 150 globular clusters. They're bunches of ancient stars some tightly packed with dense cores. Others looser. They may contain tens, even hundreds of thousands of stars. There could be a million in one of the largest globular clusters, 47 Tucani. Lastly, to galaxies. The blue patches in this time lapse are the Magellanic Clouds, two satellite galaxies of the Milky Way. With no distinctive shape, they're called irregular galaxies. By contrast, Andromeda is a well-defined spiral galaxy and largest member of our local group. Beyond that group, an elliptical galaxy with a dusty band known as NGC 5128. Still farther, this one is an edge-on spiral. Its reference, NGC 4945 and another, NGC 4565. NGC means New General Catalogue. Even deeper into space, the Sombrero Galaxy is also an edge-on spiral. Here's an elliptical galaxy, M87. M is for Messier, the catalogue of a French astronomer. This is a face-on spiral, NGC 2997. 55 million light-years from home. And this, a barred spiral, NGC 1365, at 60 million light-years. The central bar also features in NGC 1300, at 75 million light-years. Most galaxies occur in groups, some with just two or three members. Others are vast, like the Virgo cluster, bustling with some 3,000 galaxies. A little more distant is the Fornax cluster, less rich in galaxies, but sporting some gems. Still farther, the Coma cluster, with more than a 1,000 galaxies. And here, the distant Perseus cluster, a rich but faint array. These are the most remote galaxies ever glimpsed, four billion times fainter than stars we see by naked eye. Images from the Hubble Space Telescope. No matter, we'll never glimpse them, for the cosmos is an endless journey of fascination, however we view it.
In the nightly theater of the heavens, there's more to stargazing than the stars, the planets, and the moon. There are special acts, celestial vagabonds whose unpredictability makes them all the more exciting, cosmic show-offs such as meteors, asteroids, and most famously, comets. Comets come from beyond the planets, exotic wanderers that for weeks, even months, can steal the show. Visitors like Halley's Comet, which appears just once in 76 years. Comets are the nomads of our solar system. Some travel on random elliptical orbits, hurtling among the planets. Kamikaze comets plunge into the sun. Others just graze its surface. To understand comets, we must travel back nearly five billion years to the birth of the solar system. From a primeval nebula of gas and dust, the sun first coalesced. Then, from the heavier elements, the inner planets formed, solid little worlds like Earth and Mars. As the sun grew hotter, it generated a solar wind. Upon it were carried lighter elements. They formed the outer planets, gas giants like Jupiter and Neptune. And far beyond, a third of the way to the nearest star, settled a vast cloud of icy debris. Like a shell enveloping the planets, it's so diffuse you could pass through without noticing. This is the Oort cloud, where comets incubate. Every so often, one is dislodged from the equilibrium of Oort by a twitch in the gravitational interplay between the Sun and its neighboring stars. Thus begins a tumble toward the planets, the comet relentlessly drawn inward by the sun. Tails of gas and dust develop as the comet reaches the inner solar system. Ices vaporize. They stream off as fluorescing gas, millions of kilometers through space. All of this from a nucleus that might be no bigger than a football stadium. The tails only exist within the inner planets as the comet bathes in the warmth of the sun. And the gas tail always points away from the sun, blown backward by the solar wind. As it swings round the sun, this comet is returning to the cold outer depths, where its tails will disappear. From Earth, comets seem to hang motionless in the sky. In reality, they're traveling at many kilometers a second. But such are the stresses of the inner solar system that a comet nucleus may break up. With several fragments now streaming material, the tail can flare magnificently. In the wake of comets come shooting stars, properly known as meteors. As Earth intersects the trails of comets, dust burns up in our atmosphere and meteors shower the sky. For a second or two, even a tiny grain can spark the heavens. Larger fragments, often originating from asteroids, produce fireballs and, if they survive to the surface, they become known as meteorites. Set in silver at the base of a black structure called the Chaba is possibly the most famous meteorite of all. In Mecca, at the time of the Hajj, millions assemble at this birthplace of Muhammad. Like Muslims throughout the world, the pilgrims pray toward their sacred stone, believed to be a gift to Abraham from the Archangel Gabriel. But there's a more prosaic view. 
Some scientists suggest the stone is one of the countless missiles that have pocked our planet since it was born. In other words, a meteorite burnt black by atmospheric friction as it careened to Earth. Australia, a land of contrasts. Beyond the urban fringe lies a vast and open continent. With its arid climate and undeveloped landscape, the outback is a mecca itself for those who seek traces of meteorites. These are the Henbury craters, dug by a meteorite that had broken into a clutch of missiles. And this is Wolf Creek, blasted by a similar sized projectile that remained intact. The crater is almost a kilometer across. The impactor was the size of a large house and probably metal. Were it less substantial, even a rock 20 stories high, it would have vaporized in the atmosphere. Wolf Creek is 300,000 years old. Goss's Bluff is older, 140 million years, and 22 kilometers wide. Arizona, and another pockmark in the desert. This is Meteor Crater, gouged by a lump of nickel and iron 40 meters wide. The crater is well over a kilometer, 50,000 years old, it still speaks of cosmic energy. And that energy keeps coming. In 1972, this space rock, twice the size of the Arizona impactor, was caught on camera. Luckily, it skipped off the upper atmosphere and back into space. 1992, during high school football on America's east coast, a fireball it fragmented, and some chunks were recovered as meteorites. Here's the incident from Pittsburgh. Siberia, 1908. This projectile, 60 meters wide, didn't reach the ground. It exploded in the atmosphere with the energy of a nuclear bomb. over 2,000 square kilometers of uninhabited forest was flattened. Had this happened over New York, millions would be dead. As our partner in space, the moon is testimony to Earth's vulnerability. Lifeless and barren, no ocean, nothing hides these lunar craters, each one the print of an impact. The moon has some 30,000 craters, uneroded by wind or water, a pristine record of wax from space. Per square kilometer, Earth takes as many hits. Strip away our atmosphere, our seas, our vegetation, and all geological movement, and this would be our planet. And were it not for Jupiter, Earth would take far more knocks. Jupiter, here with one of its many moons, acts as a shield to the inner planets. Comets that pass too close are captured by Jupiter's Herculean gravity. This one, Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9, was pulled from its elliptical orbit around the Sun. The comet, a fragile mix of ice and grit, was drawn to within 50,000 kilometers. It paid the price. Jupiter tore it into more than 20 fragments. And that was just the beginning. Shoemaker-Levy 9 was to stage a celestial showpiece. The comet was to plunge into Jupiter and carpet bomb the soupy atmosphere. 
From its perch in Earth orbit, the Hubble Space Telescope revealed a string of pearls. And because they were discovered well over a year before the event, astronomers had time to prepare. They'd watch as the multiple hearts of a comet hit a planet 1,300 times bigger than Earth. July 1994, and in New South Wales, the Anglo-Australian telescope was zeroing in. The week of the comet was at hand, and Shoemaker-Levy was performing brilliantly. As scientists had calculated, more than 20 pieces of grit and ice hurtled into the gas giant. Some were as big as mountains. But because the impacts were on the far side of Jupiter, just out of sight from Earth, observers had to hold their collective breath as the planet's spin brought the sight of each impact into view. Patience and preparation were rewarded. Day by day, these heat-sensitive images displayed the aftermath of each impact. More than 20 major collisions at 60 kilometers a second. Some were bigger than expected. In Australia, astronomers awaited a grand finale. Okay. Okay, sir, Dave. Okay. It was an astrofest. Front row seats at a celestial premiere with a nail-biting climax. And then you'll see at the bottom of the image, if one of them will get particularly right, so it's right at the bottom, the very edge. The impacts had come thick and fast. Each comet fragment had a letter. Tonight's vigil was for fragment W. David Crisp of California's Jet Propulsion Laboratory was team leader. As W approached Jupiter, tension mounted. Would the comet end with a bang or a whimper? Yes. Oh, <laughs> it was a dazzler, a signal so bright the astronomers had to protect the telescope's delicate sensors. Close down just a touch, Frank. Uh, down to 2.3, probably. And now for the picture of the blast. Whoa. Whoa. Got it. <laughs> Very dramatic. That evening, Crisp's team had captured the best image taken on Earth. The string of pearls a month before collision, with fragment W in the ring. Impact time predictions had been spot on. And so had imaging. From Earth, here's a plume rising a thousand kilometers above Jupiter's horizon. And from a spacecraft, the actual impact of fragment W and the resulting plume. For months afterwards, Jupiter sported its scars, and they could be seen through the smallest telescope. Were this to happen on Earth, the result would be catastrophic. The dark crescent in these pictures is a shockwave as large as Earth itself. Imagine if Shoemaker Levy 9 had hit us. Long ago, another comet swung close by Jupiter. It too, like Shoemaker Levy, had its orbit forever changed by the gravity of the giant planet. That comet was Halley. Today, it travels on a long elliptical orbit that carries it out beyond Neptune and back again for a spin around the sun. Thanks to Jupiter, Halley is locked into a 76-year cycle. It last came our way in 1986. It's due back in 2061. Our understanding of comets began with Halley. More than any other, it's helped unlock the mystery of their origin. The story begins in the 17th century with the English astronomer Edmund Halley. Halley's friend and compatriot, Isaac Newton, the great physicist and mathematician, developed the theory of gravity. Bodies in space, he deduced, didn't travel in straight lines. Instead, their motion was bent by the attraction of others. 
1680, Newton observed the motion of a comet. He worked out that it wasn't traveling in a straight line, but in an orbit around the sun. So he suggested that a comet with a small enough orbit might be seen again and again. To test the idea, Edmund Halley analyzed the sightings of 24 comets. Two important observations emerged. First, three of the sightings were separated roughly by the same 76-year interval. Second, these same three comets seem to have virtually identical orbits. Could they be one and the same comet, a regular visitor? If so, the next return should be in 1758. Sure enough, on Christmas Day, 1758, long after Halley's death, the comet reappeared. It was named Halley's Comet. The revelation allowed astronomers to trace the comet back through time. One of these Chinese tomb drawings confirms Halley's appearance a century or two BC. A coin struck in memory of Julius Caesar also bears an image of Halley. It had been seen in the emperor's youth. This, from 648, is what people called a broom star. It's the same comet. In 1301, the Italian painter Giotto made Halley's Comet the Star of Bethlehem. Halley wasn't seen that first Christmas, but some astronomers have suggested another comet led the wise men on their journey. By the time of Halley's appearance in 1910, the world of advertising had caught up with history's most famous comet. Early 20th century scientists greeted the return of Halley with a new tool, photography. But the pictures lacked detail. The comet withheld its secrets. Three quarters of a century later, Halley's comet was back. This was its space age debut. In 1982, although still invisible optically, Halley was detected electronically. Then, through telescopes in 1983 and 84, Halley appeared to loop the loop, an effect of Earth's path around the Sun. By late 85, as it passed through Taurus, Halley could be seen in binoculars. A tail developed in December, and the comet was visible by naked eye. In January 86, the Northern Hemisphere had its best views. Halley was then lost for a while behind the sun, before reappearing in the skies of the southern hemisphere. Observers had magnificent views from late February to mid-April, twin tails quite discernible. But the show was almost over. Halley had begun its return to the outer planets. Before it disappeared, however, the comet was investigated and probed as never before from Earth and from space probes, data galore. Here, a head-on shot with spirals of gas trailing into space. The best images were recorded in the Southern Hemisphere, from the Chilean Andes. These show Halley after it rounded the sun. And this, from the unpolluted skies of equatorial Africa, a fuzzy cloud called the coma, clearly visible as it shrouded the comet's nucleus. A curved tail of dust that appeared yellowish to the naked eye. And a straight tail of gas, fluorescing blue over millions of kilometers. Another view from Africa. And for the first time, Scientists did more than merely observe the comet. They reached out to it. As Halley sped past, an armada of robot spacecraft raced to intercept it. The most ambitious was a European probe 
named Giotto. Giotto was going for the closest of close encounters. It was to fly right through the inner coma, the cloud of dust and gas that surrounds the nucleus. And there was the nucleus, like a peanut, a lump of primeval matter 16 kilometers by nine. Through the glare and fog, this was the very face of Halley. Vaporized by the heat of the sun, gas vented from cracks in the surface at 20 tons a second, dust at 10. The coma, fed by the jets, was well over a million kilometers across, bigger even than the sun. Giotto's transmission was knocked out with little more than a thousand kilometers to go. But the probe had revealed a hardened shell of carbon black over an icy interior. From Earth, Halley put on its best show as it pulled away from the sun. Photographed over several months, the comet's tail lengthened and shortened day to day. Its overall brilliance fluctuated too. Astronomers attributed the variations to the solar wind, to changes in the composition of the comet's surface, and to the rotation of the nucleus. From the deep chill beyond Neptune to its tour of the sun, Halley's surface had heated to over 90 degrees Celsius. In the late 80s, as Halley receded, so its image faded. Then suddenly, in 1991, it brightened. Could the comet have collided with something? We'll find out in 2061. By 1994, as it headed out past Saturn, Halley's comet was a few specks on a photograph. As we've seen, comets can originate in the Oort cloud. But some, like Halley, come from closer in, from just beyond the farthest planets. It's a region called the Kuiper Belt, and when Halley began tumbling inward, it was lucky. Instead of falling into the sun, Halley swung round it. But that means Halley is captive, locked in a vast ellipse that will take it round the sun again and again. At 76 years, Halley's orbit is relatively short. Longer period comets arrive from farther out, from the Oort cloud. Comets like Hale-Bopp, the most spectacular of recent times. Hale-Bopp, which appeared in 1997, has an orbital period of several thousand years. Here in close-up, Hale-Bopp's nucleus was 40 kilometers wide. It swirled gas and dust. They streamed from the hemisphere heated by the sun, switching on and off as the nucleus rotated. At its closest to the sun, Hale-Bopp shed a thousand tons of dust every second. Little wonder there's less and less of a comet each time it passes the sun. Unlike comets, asteroids are from closer to home. Like a planet that never coalesced, they form a ring between the orbits of Jupiter and Mars, the asteroid belt. Made of sterner stuff than comets, asteroids are rock and metal, debris from the birth of the solar system. Within the belt, asteroids are harmless, but accidents happen. collision or a jolt from Jupiter's gravity and an asteroid is knocked from its orbit. Drawn inward by solar gravity and with a nudge from Mars, this space mountain is now a projectile. 65 million years ago, this is believed to have happened. 10 kilometers of rock and metal were on a collision course with Earth.
It was doomsday for the dinosaurs. Earth suffered a cosmic winter and mass extinction. At least 100,000 dislodged asteroids cross the orbit of Earth. 2,000 are big enough to cause us problems. This one is Eros, 40 kilometers wide. So real is their threat to Earth that NASA commissioned a probe to Eros to analyze and image the asteroid from every angle. In 2001, the probe landed on Eros, the better to make its acquaintance. Were we hit by Eros, nothing. No life on Earth would survive. The worry is that for every asteroid plotted here, 20 or more are yet to be discovered. So what could we do if one were headed our way? It's still science fiction, but we could build a parabolic mirror. Towed into space, it could concentrate reflected sunlight on an intruder and scorch it off course. In another concept, giant pods might close with an enemy asteroid and attach to its surface. They would release super sails that caught the solar wind and tugged the intruder away. Or how about this device? Like a celestial outboard motor, it could shunt the object to a safer course. But suppose there was too little warning. A space rock would hit us in weeks. Would we go for the nuclear option? It would be a last resort, either as a standoff blast or a direct strike. Who could predict if it would save the world?
general catalogue. Even deeper into space, the Sombrero Galaxy is also an edge-on spiral. Here's an elliptical galaxy, M87. M is for Messier, the catalogue of a French astronomer. This is a face-on spiral, NGC 2997, 55 million light-years from home. And this, a barred spiral, NGC 1365, at 60 million light-years. The central bar also features in NGC 1300, at 75 million light-years. Most galaxies occur in groups, some with just two or three members. Others are vast, like the Virgo cluster, bustling with some 3,000 galaxies. A little more distant is the Fornax cluster, less rich in galaxies, but sporting some gems. Still farther, the Coma cluster, with more than a 1,000 galaxies. And here, the distant Perseus cluster, a rich but faint array. These are the most remote galaxies ever glimpsed, four billion times fainter than stars we see by naked eye. Images from the Hubble Space Telescope. No matter, we'll never glimpse them, for the cosmos is an endless journey of fascination, however we view it. In the nightly theatre of the heavens, there's more to stargazing than the stars, the planets, and the moon. There are special acts, celestial vagabonds whose unpredictability makes them all the more exciting, cosmic show-offs such as meteors, asteroids, and, most famously, comets. Comets come from beyond the planets, exotic wanderers that for weeks, even months, can steal the show. Visitors like Halley's Comet, which appears just once in 76 years. Comets are the nomads of our solar system. Some travel on random elliptical orbits, hurtling among the planets. Kamikaze comets plunge into the sun. Others just graze its surface. To understand comets, we must travel back nearly five billion years to the birth of the solar system. From a primeval nebula of gas and dust, the sun first coalesced. Then, from the heavier elements, the inner planets formed, solid little worlds like Earth and Mars. As the sun grew hotter, it generated a solar wind. Upon it were carried lighter elements. They formed the outer planets, gas giants like Jupiter and Neptune. And far beyond, a third of the way to the nearest star, settled a vast cloud of icy debris. 
like a shell enveloping the planets. It's so diffuse you could pass through without noticing. This is the Oort cloud, where comets incubate. Every so often, one is dislodged from the equilibrium of Oort by a twitch in the gravitational interplay between the Sun and its neighboring stars. Thus begins a tumble toward the planets, the comet relentlessly drawn inward by the Sun. Tails of gas and dust develop as the comet reaches the inner solar system. Ices vaporize. They stream off as fluorescing gas, millions of kilometers through space. All of this from a nucleus that might be no bigger than a football stadium. The tails only exist within the inner planets as the comet bathes in the warmth of the sun. And the gas tail always points away from the sun, blown backward by the solar wind. As it swings round the sun, this comet is returning to the cold outer depths, where its tails will disappear. From Earth, comets seem to hang motionless in the sky. In reality, they're traveling at many kilometers a second. But such are the stresses of the inner solar system that a comet nucleus may break up. With several fragments now streaming material, the tail can flare magnificently. In the wake of comets come shooting stars, properly known as meteors. As Earth intersects the trails of comets, dust burns up in our atmosphere and meteors shower the sky. For a second or two, even a tiny grain can spark the heavens. Larger fragments, often originating from asteroids, produce fireballs, and if they survive to the surface, they become known as meteorites. Set in silver at the base of a black structure called the Chaba is possibly the most famous meteorite of all. In Mecca, at the time of the Hajj, millions assemble at this birthplace of Muhammad. Like Muslims throughout the world, the pilgrims pray toward their sacred stone, believed to be a gift to Abraham from the Archangel Gabriel. But there's a more prosaic view. Some scientists suggest the stone is one of the countless missiles that have pocked our planet since it was born. In other words, a meteorite burnt black by atmospheric friction as it careened to Earth. Australia, a land of contrasts. Beyond the urban fringe lies a vast and open continent. With its arid climate and undeveloped landscape, the outback is a mecca itself for those who seek traces of meteorites. These are the Henbury craters, dug by a meteorite that had broken into a clutch of missiles. And this is Wolf Creek, blasted by a similar sized projectile that remained intact. The crater is almost a kilometer across. The impactor was the size of a large house and probably metal. Were it less substantial, even a rock 20 stories high, it would have vaporized in the atmosphere. Wolf Creek is 300,000 years old. Goss's bluff is older, 140 million years and 22 kilometers wide. Arizona, and another pockmark in the desert. This is Meteor Crater, gouged by a lump of nickel and iron 40 meters wide. The crater is well over a kilometer. 50,000 years old, it still speaks of cosmic energy.
and that energy keeps coming. In 1972, this space rock, twice the size of the Arizona impactor, was caught on camera. Luckily, it skipped off the upper atmosphere and back into space. 1992, during high school football on America's east coast, a fireball. It fragmented and some chunks were recovered as meteorites. Here's the incident from Pittsburgh. Siberia, 1908. This projectile, 60 meters wide, didn't reach the ground. It exploded in the atmosphere with the energy of a nuclear bomb. Over 2,000 square kilometers of uninhabited forest was flattened. Had this happened over New York, millions would be dead. As our partner in space, the moon is testimony to Earth's vulnerability. Lifeless and barren, no ocean, nothing hides these lunar craters, each one the print of an impact. The moon has some 30,000 craters, uneroded by wind or water, a pristine record of wax from space. Per square kilometer, Earth takes as many hits. Strip away our atmosphere, our seas, our vegetation, and all geological movement, and this would be our planet. And were it not for Jupiter, Earth would take far more knocks. Jupiter, here with one of its many moons, acts as a shield to the inner planets. Comets that pass too close are captured by Jupiter's Herculean gravity. This one, Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9, was pulled from its elliptical orbit around the Sun. The comet, a fragile mix of ice and grit, was drawn to within 50,000 kilometers. It paid the price. Jupiter tore it into more than 20 fragments. And that was just the beginning. Shoemaker-Levy 9 was to stage a celestial showpiece. The comet was to plunge into Jupiter and carpet bomb the soupy atmosphere. From its perch in Earth orbit, the Hubble Space Telescope revealed a string of pearls. And because they were discovered well over a year before the event, astronomers had time to prepare. They'd watch as the multiple hearts of a comet hit a planet 1,300 times bigger than Earth. July 1994, and in New South Wales, the Anglo-Australian telescope was zeroing in. The week of the comet was at hand, and Shoemaker-Levy was performing brilliantly. As scientists had calculated, more than 20 pieces of grit and ice hurtled into the gas giant. Some were as big as mountains. But because the impacts were on the far side of Jupiter, just out of sight from Earth, observers had to hold their collective breath as the planet's spin brought the sight of each impact into view. Patience and preparation were rewarded. Day by day, these heat-sensitive images displayed the aftermath of each impact. More than 20 major collisions at 60 kilometers a second. Some were bigger than expected. In Australia, astronomers awaited a grand finale. Okay. Okay, okay. 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 Oh, God. It was an astro fest. Front row seats at a celestial premiere with a nail biting climax. And then you'll see at the bottom of the image, if one of them will get particularly okay. bright, you'll see right at the bottom, the very edge. The impacts had come thick and fast. Each comet fragment had a letter. Tonight's vigil was for Fragment W. David Crisp of California's Jet Propulsion Laboratory was team leader. 
As W approached Jupiter, tension mounted. Would the comet end with a bang or a whimper? Yes. Oh, <laughs> it was a dazzler, a signal so bright the astronomers had to protect the telescope's delicate sensors. Close down just a touch, Frank. Uh, down to 2.3, probably. And now for the picture of the blast. Wow! Whoa. 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 Got it! <laughs> Very dramatic. That evening, CRISP's team had captured the best image taken on Earth. The string of pearls a month before collision, with fragment W in the ring. Impact time predictions had been spot on. And so had imaging. From Earth, here's a plume rising a thousand kilometers above Jupiter's horizon. And from a spacecraft, the actual impact of fragment W and the resulting plume. For months afterwards, Jupiter sported its scars, and they could be seen through the smallest telescope. Were this to happen on Earth, the result would be catastrophic. The dark crescent in these pictures is a shockwave as large as Earth itself. Imagine if Shoemaker Levy 9 had hit us. Long ago, another comet swung close by Jupiter. It too, like Shoemaker-Levy, had its orbit forever changed by the gravity of the giant planet. That comet was Halley. Today, it travels on a long elliptical orbit that carries it out beyond Neptune and back again for a spin around the Sun. Thanks to Jupiter, Halley is locked into a 76-year cycle. It last came our way in 1986. It's due back in 2061. Our understanding of comets began with Halley. More than any other, it's helped unlock the mystery of their origin. The story begins in the 17th century with the English astronomer Edmund Halley. Halley's friend and compatriot, Isaac Newton, the great physicist and mathematician, developed the theory of gravity. Bodies in space, he deduced, didn't travel in straight lines. Instead, their motion was bent by the attraction of others. In 1680, Newton observed the motion of a comet. He worked out that it wasn't traveling in a straight line, but in an orbit around the sun. So he suggested that a comet with a small enough orbit might be seen again and again. To test the idea, Edmund Halley analyzed the sightings of 24 comets. Two important observations emerged. First, three of the sightings were separated roughly by the same 76-year interval. Second, these same three comets seem to have virtually identical orbits. Could they be one and the same comet, a regular visitor? If so, the next return should be in 1758. Sure enough, on Christmas Day, 1758, long after Halley's death, the comet reappeared. It was named Halley's Comet. The revelation allowed astronomers to trace the comet back through time. One of these Chinese tomb drawings confirms Halley's appearance a century or two BC. A coin struck in memory of Julius Caesar also bears an image of Halley. It had been seen in the emperor's youth. This, from 648, is what people called a broom star. It's the same comet. In 1301, the Italian painter Giotto made Halley's Comet the Star of Bethlehem. Halley wasn't seen that first Christmas, but some astronomers have suggested another comet led the wise men on their journey. By the time of Halley's appearance in 1910, 
the world of advertising had caught up with history's most famous comet. Early 20th century scientists greeted the return of Halley with a new tool, photography. But the pictures lacked detail. The comet withheld its secrets. Three quarters of a century later, Halley's comet was back. This was its space age debut. In 1982, although still invisible optically, Halley was detected electronically. Then, through telescopes in 1983 and 84, Halley appeared to loop the loop, an effect of Earth's path around the sun. By late 85, as it passed through Taurus, Halley could be seen in binoculars. A tail developed in December, and the comet was visible by naked eye. In January 86, the northern hemisphere had its best views. Halley was then lost for a while behind the sun, before reappearing in the skies of the southern hemisphere. Observers had magnificent views from late February to mid-April, twin tails quite discernible. But the show was almost over. Halley had begun its return to the outer planets. Before it disappeared, however, the comet was investigated and probed as never before. From Earth and from space probes, data galore. Here, a head-on shot with spirals of gas trailing into space. The best images were recorded in the southern hemisphere. From the Chilean Andes, these show Halley after it rounded the sun. And this from the unpolluted skies of equatorial Africa. A fuzzy cloud called the coma, clearly visible as it shrouded the comet's nucleus. A curved tail of dust that appeared yellowish to the naked eye. And a straight tail of gas, fluorescing blue over millions of kilometers. Another view from Africa. And for the first time, scientists did more than merely observe the comet. They reached out to it. As Halley sped past, an armada of robot spacecraft raced to intercept it. The most ambitious was a European probe named Giotto. Giotto was going for the closest of close encounters. It was to fly right through the inner coma, the cloud of dust and gas that surrounds the nucleus. And there was the nucleus, like a peanut, a lump of primeval matter, 16 kilometers by nine. Through the glare and fog, this was the very face of Halley. Vaporized by the heat of the sun, gas vented from cracks in the surface at 20 tons a second, dust at 10. The coma, fed by the jets, was well over a million kilometers across, bigger even than the sun. Giotto's transmission was knocked out with little more than a thousand kilometers to go. But the probe had revealed a hardened shell of carbon black over an icy interior. From Earth, Halley put on its best show as it pulled away from the sun. Photographed over several months, the comet's tail lengthened and shortened day to day. Its overall brilliance fluctuated too. Astronomers attributed the variations to the solar wind, to changes in the composition of the comet's surface, and to the rotation of the nucleus. From the deep chill beyond Neptune to its tour of the sun, Halley's surface had heated to over 90 degrees Celsius. In the late 80s, as Halley receded, so its image faded. Then suddenly, in 1991, it brightened. 
Could the comet have collided with something? We'll find out in 2061. By 1994, as it headed out past Saturn, Halley's Comet was a few specks on a photograph. As we've seen, comets can originate in the Oort cloud. But some, like Halley, come from closer in, from just beyond the farthest planets. It's a region called the Kuiper Belt, and when Halley began tumbling inward, it was lucky. Instead of falling into the sun, Halley swung round it. But that means Halley is captive, locked in a vast ellipse that will take it round the sun again and again. At 76 years, Halley's orbit is relatively short. Longer period comets arrive from farther out, from the Oort cloud. Comets like Hale-Bopp, the most spectacular of recent times. Hale-Bopp, which appeared in 1997, has an orbital period of several thousand years. Here in close-up, Hale-Bopp's nucleus was 40 kilometers wide. It swirled gas and dust. They streamed from the hemisphere heated by the sun, switching on and off as the nucleus rotated. At its closest to the sun, Hale-Bopp shed a thousand tons of dust every second. Little wonder there's less and less of a comet each time it passes the sun. Unlike comets, asteroids are from closer to home. Like a planet that never coalesced, they form a ring between the orbits of Jupiter and Mars, the asteroid belt. Made of sterner stuff than comets, asteroids are rock and metal, debris from the birth of the solar system. Within the belt, asteroids are harmless, but accidents happen. collision or a jolt from Jupiter's gravity and an asteroid is knocked from its orbit. Drawn inward by solar gravity and with a nudge from Mars, this space mountain is now a projectile. 65 million years ago, this is believed to have happened. 10 kilometers of rock and metal were on a collision course with Earth. It was doomsday for the dinosaurs. Earth suffered a cosmic winter and mass extinction. At least 100,000 dislodged asteroids cross the orbit of Earth. 2,000 are big enough to cause us problems. This one is Eros, 40 kilometers wide. So real is their threat to Earth that NASA commissioned a probe to Eros to analyze and image the asteroid from every angle. In 2001, the probe landed on Eros, the better to make its acquaintance. 